Privacy Conference. Uh, it will be lots of fun as yesterday. Um, and today I want to talk a bit about uh, the efforts we are doing right now at Wasabi Wallet to uh, figure out how to be efficient at making coin joins on the Bitcoin blockchain and to get a lot of ambiguity about the transaction graph that we generate. And it's a, it's a pretty hard problem. Um, I don't know all the answers to it. Uh, and so hopefully today we can figure out some new additional things. So this will be quite a uh, open discussion, uh, Socratic approach. So I'll, I'll continue asking you questions and please help me figuring this out. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I guess uh, to, to start with, like, um, what do you guys think is Im important aspects to consider for, for Bitcoin on-chain privacy? Like w what do we actually want to achieve here? Uh huh. Yes. So, and, and why is no no history an important aspect? A uh, simple example is if I pay someone, maybe at a shop, uh, if they were able to infer from the transaction that, let's say, I am rich, I am Bitcoin rich, then their friend might come round to my house and and mug me, uh -huh. or steal. Okay, so the transaction history is tied to your previous financial activity, uh, including how much money you earned, right? yeah. and also when you earned it uh, on top of that. Uh -huh. uh, other important aspects we should consider in, uh, for on-chain privacy? Uh, to achieve anonymity? Yeah. Uh -huh. So what's exactly anonymity? Okay, what about things that are related to position? I mean, in what Adam said, he is scared about someone knowing a lot more that they should know. Mm -hmm. And not only about the history, but these people, because he paid, assume that all the coins that are behind this payment are his, even uh -huh. though they are not. So, so I know that it's very hard to prove a, non, uh, a negative, but since the blockchain is completely transparent, you don't know who did the transactions before those ones. Mm -hmm. And if there is a big, very big one before, maybe it could be yours. They don't mm -hmm. really know. Yeah. yeah and uh, like, uh, er, for example, Chomi and eCash back in the early days, that was a very anonymous system, right? It was impossible to, to see all the transaction that was happening, especially when you're not the mint. Um, however, Bitcoin is, is a very transparent system, right? We see all the transactions that's going on. We see all the addresses that get paid and the, the coins that get spent. Um, so it's, it's more of a pseudonymous system. Um, and that, uh, that means we want to achieve uh, unlinkability between our different identities. Right? That, that two addresses that look presumably random from, from the outside are not later tied uh, to the same identity. Uh, so that's another thing we want to prevent. Um, any other important aspects of, uh, about Bitcoin on-chain privacy? Costs. <laughs> ah, that's a very good one. Because right, um, uh, not only in money, in brain power brain to power. figure out <laughs> How yeah. you do it? Yeah, and time as well. Huh? Right, latency is a big issue. Um, people want to make payments fast and cheap and private, uh, and and that's a very difficult trade-off matrix. And and um, so, wha what are the different costs that we encounter on the Bitcoin network? Fees. Uh huh. W mining fees. You mean? Uh huh. Uh -huh. Fees for the services like yours. Uh huh. Yes, fees for services as well, uh, and uh, arguably fees for the internet that, that you're using uh -huh. to uh, to do these. Right? Learning curve. The learning curve, exactly. Um, that's time as well. Right? It takes some time to get to know the products or the, the softwares, to learn how, which problems they solve and how to use them. The risk about not doing it well and, and thinking that you were private, but you're not. Uh, that's another good one. Um, like to have perceived privacy where, where, where you think nobody can link certain payments to the same identity, where in fact it's, it's doable. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh -huh. Yep. Right, the, the actual physical hardware, um, especially for a Bitcoin full node, that's, that's quite expensive. You need lots of bandwidth, lots of disk space, and I guess a good CPU to do all the verification. So yeah, that's uh, all of that's not, not as cheap. Right. Um, 
Yeah, and then the, uh, the, the, uh, the block space itself, right? We have to pay the miners for every virtual byte of block space uh, that, that we create. Um, and that tends to add up uh, quite as well. And, um, so wh what, like, wh how, how can we put this all under one hood, right? So we have hardware cost. Uh, I think that's pretty static, regardless of how you use Bitcoin. Maybe you have a bit extra cost if you use a full node compared to a light wallet. Um, uh, then the bandwidth, the internet, uh, that's also really interesting, right? If you use a Bitcoin full node, you have quite a high amount of bandwidth. You download every block um, and that's hundreds of gigabytes of data. And, and you also send the Bitcoin blocks to, to other peers on the network. So you have download and, and upload uh, as well. Um, and I think that can be reduced by running a, a light client. Right, of by not downloading every block and not uploading every block. Uh, but, but then we have the big problem of, uh, well, how, how do we run a light client in a private way? Um, so what are some ways that, that or wh first of all, why do we even run a Bitcoin full node? Like, wh why is that useful for us? Wh why do we do that in the first place? To, to validate transactions, yes. And, and which transactions are you interested in? Exactly. Right, so you're a merchant, you're selling pizza, and you want to know that the money that you received is actually valid before you hand out the pizza. Right? Um, but the, the tricky thing with Bitcoin is that in order to verify that the transaction that you just received is valid, you have to verify every transaction that ever happened. Right? So even though you're ultimately only interested in your own transactions, their validity depends on all the other transactions that happened since the Genesis block, since 2009. Um, so then uh, w let's say uh, you, you don't want to actually do that full verification of everything. What are some other approaches of finding out how much money you have other than running a full node? Say that again. Explore, block Explorer, yes. Uh, so that's basically someone else's full node that you can access via a browser, like well, this one. Um, and then you type in an address or a transaction ID, some unique identifier, um, and you see if there's transactions related to this uh, on, yeah, on, on the Bitcoin network. Um, what's some problems with going to a block explorer, especially in regards to privacy? Exactly, right, so you leak your IP address. How, how could you prevent that? <laughs> run your own explorer, yeah, but then we're back to running your own full node. A VPN, yep, that's one solution. What else? Yeah, trust me, bro, I'm not tracking at all. Yeah. Um, what other thing than a VPN? It's one more big one. Onion routing, exactly, the Tor browser. Uh, that, that hides your IP address as well. But even when your IP address is hidden, that explorer still will know that someone is interested in this specific address. And, and, and that's already an, uh, a piece of identifying information um, that, that is revealed. Um, so the first approach of finding out how much money you have is to run your own full node to verify everything. The second approach is to send someone else who is running a full node to send that person your addresses and to ask that person, hey, how much money do I have? Uh, are there other approaches? Any ideas? We talked about them yesterday as well. Right? There, there was uh, one approach was to put all of your addresses into this compact filter called the Bloom filter, and then to send this address filter to someone else uh, who gives you a bunch of uh, information about the addresses that are included. But is there another approach? Flipping this on the head. You, another person could take the information that's in a block and compress that into a tiny filter, so to say. And now you have a compressed block, a block filter. Uh, and the person who runs the full node can send you this block filter, a short identifier of all the information in the block. And then you can locally synchronize this block filter to find out if, if you have 
uh, addresses in this block. Uh, and if, if you think so, then you can download the block from someone else um, and, have, uh, and then synchronize the entire block. Right? So instead of you sending a compact filter of all your addresses to someone else, that someone else who runs a node sends a compact filter of all the information in the block to you. Um, and you can check this way if there's addresses uh, in that block. So this is then how we ultimately find out how much money we have in a private way without relying on running a full node. Right? So this means we have uh, less storage uh, because you don't need to download the entire blockchain, so also less bandwidth, uh, and less computational time. You don't need to verify every block that happened. You trust the verification of someone else. You just need to synchronize or, or, or scan uh, the block for, for your address, but you don't actually verify it. Right? So th this is a, a privacy-focused, uh, lightweight wallet approach to reduce the cost of finding out how much money you, money you have while still keeping your privacy. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, that node can definitely lie to you. Um, it can take arbitrary information and put that into a compact filter and pretend that that's the Bitcoin block. It can exclude certain addresses or transactions from the compact block filter. And, and there's no way for you to verifying that unless you download and verify every block since Genesis. Right, so with these block filters, yes, you trust someone else's node to verify the entire chain, and they can lie to you by omission, so removing some information. And yeah, so th so then if if your address is not in the block, uh, I if your address is not in the block filter, then uh, you would scan the filter and see that there is no address inside, so you would never download the the Bitcoin block in the first place. Um, however. The, that full node provider cannot just create fake blocks, so to say, because creating a block is hard. That's, that's a proof of work. Right? So you, you can't lie by changing what's in a block or by creating fake blocks, but you can lie by not including certain piece of information in the block filter, so to trick a person to not even start downloading the block. Right? Okay, so I think that covers the cost and, and the trade-offs with, with verifying how much money you have. Um, and I guess then uh, let's let's look into the other costs, which which is uh, block space, right? So um, what's so let's say you you want to get paid, uh, what information actually needs to be written onto the Bitcoin blockchain for for the average default use case? And so let's let's say you sell your pizza. Uh, you say it costs one Bitcoin. Um, what information are you expecting to be on the Bitcoin blockchain before you hand out the pizza? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So you want to have the transaction in deep into the blockchain, right? So multiple new blocks have been added on top of the block. That includes your transaction. That's that's correct. But w what are you looking for in that one transaction in the first place? Inputs and outputs. Uh huh. That's a good point. They didn't recognize my inputs. Uh, uh, uh. They didn't recognize my inputs, and so they they. They just pretended the transaction didn't exist, although their oh. output, it was there with the correct amount. So that's why I'm saying merchants should only be checking outputs, not inputs. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Right, so the, the input is uh, the, the coin that you spent. So it kind of indicates where does the money come from, and, and is where does the coin arrive. Um, and you as a merchant, you just care that the coin arrives with you. You don't care exactly about where the coin is coming from. So that's, that's a good addition. Um, and so what exactly is an output? And uh, what, what do you expect to see on the output side before you hand out the pizza? Exactly, right? So the address and the amount. What, what's the Bitcoin address? Mm -hmm. and, and how do you generate the address? <laughs> 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 so 
so there's there's a private key, which is a secret. Uh huh. Uh huh. So you have a private key, then you generate a public key, uh, and when you have a public key, you can generate an address. Depends on which address type exactly, but usually it's a hash of a public key. Um, exactly. And so this is basically a, the locking condition. You know, un under which conditions can this new coin be spent? Right, so we have the locking condition, the script, for example, uh, a public key, and saying that you need at least uh, a signature of this public key so that this coin can be spent in the future. Right, and uh, so the address is a, the definition of who can spend the coin, and the merchant defines for himself under which condition uh, he wants to spend the money in the future, for example, by generating his own private key. Right? And uh, this way he knows that because he has the private key, in the future he can spend that money. Um, so this is how you get the address, and you, the merchant knows his own address, and he wants to see his address on the output side of a coin join transaction, or sorry, of, of, a, of a regular Bitcoin transaction. And then, of course, the amount. Right? The, the pizza costs one Bitcoin, so you want to see your address worth one Bitcoin on the output side of a transaction. Exactly. And so just for wanting to get paid, you need to get your output onto the Bitcoin blockchain. So that's, I guess, the minimal amount of, of block space that you need to buy, so to say, uh, in order to get paid. Um, and who pays the, the mining fee in, in this example? The sender. Uh -huh. um, and I, I guess it's kind of a chicken and, the, of, uh, chicken and egg problem. Um, because there's not really a clear definition of, of who pays the fee. Right? Let's say there's two inputs and two outputs. So which input exactly paid for the fee? Right? Or, or which output paid for the fee? It's, it's really tough to say. Um, so the, how do we actually calculate the fee in, in a Bitcoin transaction? OK, so it has to do with the size. The size of what? Aha, uh -huh. exactly. So, yeah? Aha. Uh -huh. So we have inputs and outputs, exactly. And also a transaction header. Right. So, aha. Uh -huh. And so we have a certain amount of bytes that we want to get onto the blockchain. And there's a certain market demand at the current moment of how many bytes want to be written to the blockchain. Um, and What's the supply of block space? Exactly, right? A block has a limited size. Um, and so this means we have a limited supply, roughly one to four megabytes, kind of depends. And we have a lot of demand, because if lots of merchants want to sell their pizza, and they will only hand out the pizza if they actually see their own output on, onto the blockchain. Um, and supply demands, this means there's a price. Uh, where, where, where those two things clear out. Um, and, okay, so the fee depends on the size of the transaction, but how exactly do we pay the fee to a miner? How does that work? Does the miner have his own output? It's implicit. What does that mean? Yeah, exactly. So we have a value of inputs. Let's say 1.5 Bitcoin is on the input side. And then we have a value of the outputs. Let's say that's 1.4 Bitcoin. And so the, the rule of the Bitcoin consensus rule is that the inputs must be large. No, sorry. The, the outputs cannot be larger than the inputs. I, I think that's the rule. So um, it could be that we have 1.5 Bitcoin on the input side and 1.5 Bitcoin on the output side. Right, so inputs equals outputs. That would mean the miner gets zero, nothing. All of the value goes from the inputs into the outputs. Um, but why would a miner mine a transaction if he doesn't get paid? Right? So he, he would prefer to include a transaction that has, let's say, 1.5 Bitcoin on the input side and 1.4 Bitcoin on the output side. And the difference is impl implicitly the transfer of value to the miner. And, and where does the miner collect this value? Coinbase. Uh -huh. What's the Coinbase? <laughs> yes. So the, the, the Coinbase is the first transaction in the block. And w what's so special about this Coinbase transaction? 
it has. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so there, there's two things, right? It creates new coins. The, the first Coinbase transaction created 50 Bitcoin. And why are they new? Because a Coinbase transaction has no inputs. Okay? A Coinbase transaction has no inputs and 50 Bitcoin on the output side that are newly created. And simultaneously, all of the other transactions in the block that have the, the leftover amount, 1.5 Bitcoin input, 1.4 Bitcoin output, those 0.1 Bitcoin can be written to the Coinbase transaction as well. So you would have 50.1 Bitcoin. Um, and and that's, that's how the miners get paid. Okay, so the, the amount that we pay the miners depends very much on, on the size of the transaction. And if you want to get paid, the minimum amount that, that you want to get on the blockchain is, is one output and the amount of money that's, that's in there. Um, but then as a merchant, you don't just want to get paid. You want to spend the money in the future as well. Right? So this is another on-chain cost that we have to consider. Um, and it's uh, like... So let's, let's say you got paid 10 times in the past, and now you, you want to make payments in the future. Uh, how do we go about this? Um, and, and what's the fee that we pay for those future transactions? Wh what does the fee depend on when, when the merchant makes a payment to his suppliers? S sorry, say that again? Uh-huh. Right, so again, it depends on the amount of block space that those future transactions use. Right? And uh, let's say the merchant got paid 10 times in the past. So he has in, in his wallet 10 UTXOs, 10 coins that are currently unspent. Um, and now, if he wants to make a payment in the future, which decisions does he have to make? Uh -huh. Exactly, so you have 10 coins in your wallet. Which coins do you want to select? Uh -huh. And, and how, how does the merchant make these types of decisions? Uh -huh. So with size, you mean the, the virtual, like the block space size, or the amount, the Satoshi amount? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes, so y the, if you take less inputs in a payment transaction, you pay less fees, right? And you can use less inputs if the value of those inputs is larger than the payment amount that you want to make. Right? And um, so let's say you want to make a payment of one Bitcoin. You could either use a single input that's worth five Bitcoin, or you could use 10 inputs that are each worth 0 0.1 Bitcoin. Right? Um, so for, for the merchant, Already when he, when he gets paid, he knows that there's a cost of spending that coin in the future. Right? And the, the cost, well, the, the percentage of that cost depends on the amount of, of money that's, that's in this coin. But the other important aspect is the, the size, the, like the, the byte size of the input when it gets spent. And so, for example, there can be an input that's locked up by a single public key. So what you need to put on the blockchain in order to spend a coin with a single public key script? A signature, and just one signature, right? So that's rather small. But the merchant could have chosen a script, let's say a seven out of 10 multi-signature script. What, so what do you need to put onto the blockchain in order to spend this script or this coin? Seven signatures, and even worse, plus 10 public keys, right? So you need to uh, first lay out the exact script, the locking condition, which is the number seven and 10 public keys, plus some other opcodes, and then the, the witness, the solution to the script, which is, in our case, seven signatures. And that's quite a lot of data. And the merchant already knows when he gets paid that the size of the, of the script uh, and, and the signature, or, or the witness, that he needs to put in the future. So the merchant can somewhat account for future costs of spending a certain coin. Um, and here then again, right, the, the, the locking conditions affects how much money he has to spend in the future. Using multi-signature is a lot more expensive than using single signature. So, okay, now the merchant got paid, the merchant is paying his suppliers, um, but, uh, and let's say in that payment where he pays his suppliers, he's consolidating three inputs to make a payment output, 
and uh, his change output. Uh, so w what information is being revealed now to, to the Bitcoin network uh, and, and to the merchant? What, what information does the merchant have to receive uh, to reveal about himself when making this payment? So, sorry, said again. Uh huh. So uh, the the merchant needs to reveal the address of the supplier that he wants to pay, and right, wh whoever that is. Yes. And what else? The amount exactly. So is he making a payment for one Bitcoin or for 10 Bitcoin? Yep. Yes. Exactly. Right. So which coins are being spent, the, the inputs here? Right. And let's say if in the past there were, the merchant got paid 10 times or something in 10 different transactions across a couple months, um, e each of these transactions are kind of random looking. At, at first, you, an outside observer might not even realize that these 10 transactions all pay the same merchant right? because he might use a new address every time, hopefully. Uh, but then later, when, the, when that person who received the money is making a payment, he's consolidating, let's say, three coins. Um, exactly. And, and now we've revealed what's known as the common input ownership heuristic. There was a transaction that spent three inputs and we assume that this means that these three coins belong to the same person. And even though there is a different transaction, uh, even though there were different addresses on, on those coins. So the merchant now not just revealed which address he's paying to or, or how much money he's paying to that address, he also revealed that these three coins that he received in the past belong to the same person. Um, what else is being, uh, does the merchant have to reveal in, in order to, to pay his suppliers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's, th there's lots of other information, like which wallet was used, you know, that, that can be revealed if, if the wallet is, I guess, making mis no, mistakes, quotes and quotes, or, yeah, um, exactly. Uh, another thing is, so let's say the three inputs are worth 2.5 Bitcoin, and the payment amount is worth one Bitcoin. Now we have a, a change coin of uh, zero point, uh, sorry, of 1.5, right? And so there's ways of identifying which of the output is a payment amount and which of the output is a change amount or, or change coin. W what are some of these identifiers that, that we can use? Derivation path, uh -huh. but th the derivation path is not on the Bitcoin blockchain. Right? Th so the derivation path is um, we have we have this uh, tree keys and public keys, uh, and in which position of this tree is is your private key? That's the the derivation path, so to say. Um, but that's all done client side. What you see on the blockchain is just a public key or, or a, pri a signature, ultimately. You, d you don't see which private key was used to sign this. Right? So we can look at the future transaction history of those outputs and we can see if the future transaction history looks similar to the past transaction history. And, and uh, as you say, if, if, if one of those outputs gets consolidated with a bunch of other inputs, then it, it, we might learn that this is actually an exchange consolidating a bunch of coins that it received from different users, for example. And, um, Mm -hmm. Ah, exactly, we can have snitches, 
right? The, the, the receiver can, can make public statements or private statements that, uh, yeah, this, this coin is mine. You can even prove that, right? You can prove with a signature that you actually control or know the, pri the private key of this coin. Mm -hmm. So there, there can be, for example, that one output has an address that was reused already in the past. So is that maybe what you mean, right? So that. Uh huh. So we. Aha, uh -huh, exactly, right? So one of the outputs has 1.500000 Bitcoin, and, and the other amount has 1.234678 whatever. Right? So we have a rounded amount. A rounded amount is most commonly a payment amount because the merchant denominates his prices in, in a round amount. Right? That there's just a human bias that we prefer rounded amounts to random looking non-rounded ones. Uh, however, the the, the change output value depends on the value of the inputs and about the fee that you pay. And so the, the likelihood that the value of inputs minus the payment amount minus the fees, that this change output is a uh, precisely rounded value is very unlikely. And right? so that's why we can say that a non-rounded amount uh, is most likely going to be a change. Exactly. Uh -huh. Exactly. Yep, the, the exchange rate of Bitcoin is rather public knowledge. And we can see, okay, when was this transaction broadcast or confirmed? And then we can convert that Bitcoin amount to different fiat currencies, let's say US dollar. And it might be that uh, non -ran or a non-rounded amount of Bitcoin at that time was worth a rounded amount of US dollar. And that would be another indication that this, co this output is the actual payment. Um, Another interesting one is uh, uh, script types or address types, for example. Let's say if that all of the inputs are native SegWit version zero, and then one output is a legacy, uh, starting with the address starting with a one, and the other output is again a native SegWit. Um, then uh, w m in most wallets, you use this, the same address uh, for generating addresses to, to receive new money. So those would be the coins on the input side. You know, pre previously in the past, you generated a SegWit address uh, to get paid there. But then wallets also take the same address uh, for generating their change. Uh, sorry, the same address type for generating their change output. Um, and if the merchant uses a different address type, like legacy, uh, then uh, we might find out that this is the, the uh, payment output. Therefore, the other one is the change output. Yeah, so there's, there's quite a lot of information that we actually reveal as, as a merchant. Right? We reveal whenever we get paid. Um, we reveal how much we get paid. Um, uh, and later when we spend the money, we often reveal, hey, these multiple times where I got paid is actually the same person. Uh, we reveal how much is that payment amount in the future. Maybe we reveal uh, which output is a payment amount and, and which output is the change. And then, of course, we reveal the future transaction histories for, for both the change and the payment output. Um, and the, the merchant has to make a lot of decisions as well, right? You, uh, whenever you get paid, you have to choose uh, which address, uh, and you could reuse addresses or create new addresses, and you have to uh, define the amount of money that you're expecting. Um, and then after you have received multiple times and you want to make a payment, you need to choose which imp or which coin do you want to select for this payment, um, and also which which. Uh, witness or like which uh, solution to the script uh, do you want to use? You know, Bitcoin script can can have if state or uh, or statements. You know, either it's the single public key that can spend it, or it's this multi-signature, or it's this hash time lock, whatever. Right? And now the merchant has to choose which of these spending conditions does he want to satisfy, uh, and each of these spending conditions might have a different uh, virtual size or vir uh, different block size. Uh, that, that is required, and um, yeah, the merchant also needs to choose how much fee rate is he going to pay. Um, 
yeah, so there's lots of different things that merchants have to consider when getting paid and when paying people. Um, so now let's, let's try to work through about how we can improve our privacy here. How, how can we use Bitcoin wh while revealing less information ab about us? And so one of the things we already mentioned is generate a new address every time. This means that w at the point when you get paid, a new random looking address is being used that is not tied to any of the previous um, transactions. And so this way we can receive multiple times and to an outside observer, it's, it's not clear that these addresses or these coins belong to the same person. But then eventually we want to spend our money. And, and here there's this common input ownership heuristic that if we spend coins of different addresses at the same time in the same transaction, it seems like they belong to the same person. So what can we do to, to break this heuristic? Spread, uh, spread the amount? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So let's say you, you want to make a payment of one Bitcoin? Yeah, so uh, you have two half a Bitcoin UTXOs. You need to organize it with the merchant. I'm going to pay you half a Bitcoin here and half a Bitcoin there. You need to give me two addresses and I'm going to do it in two different blocks. Mm -hmm. Would that be a bulletproof way? Uh, yeah, that's a really good way, right? So you, uh, you ask the merchant for multiple addresses so that you can pay him multiple times. And these are new addresses, right? So they're not tied to each other by being the same address, for example. But then you also mentioned you need to do that in different blocks because there's a timing at analysis here as well. If at the very, like within five seconds, you broadcast two transactions that, uh, that pay different addresses, it might be revealed that this is, this is actually the same guy just pressing send twice after each other. So you need to press send the first time, make the first payment to the first address. A couple days later, you make the second payment. But, but um, what's the cost of doing this? You're using twice as much space in the blockchain, probably. Maybe not precisely that. And mm -hmm. time, you know, and maybe exchange rate fluctuation. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, like, uh, it's not really a problem for the merchant because they can instantly convert it both transaction times. So mm -hmm. maybe the cost is not that bad apart from just time and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Two transaction fees, more block space. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more block space. Why is it more block space? Because we have two transactions. So there's, for example, two times the transaction header. Instead of if it's one transaction, there's only one transaction header. But even worse, now the merchant has two coins. Right? So you have to put two addresses onto the blockchain with twice the amount instead of just one address with one amount. And then later in the future, the merchant has to spend the two coins that he received. So he has to put two inputs instead of one input and, and two signatures instead of one signature. So there's actually quite a lot more, more block space used for, for every coin that is generated. Because again, the cost, the block space cost for, for the coin is generating it on the output side, but then also spending it on the input side. And, and how, the re how realistic is it for then, if the merchant recombines them, for them to work backwards and say, ah. Aha, that's the other thing, right? No, the merchant has two different coins, but then what does he do in the future with it? If in the future he consolidates those two coins in the same transaction, then he reveals common input ownership again. Right? And then at least now it's... Uh -huh. Separately. Sorry, I've already <laughs> finished, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, finished, so, sorry. so the, it, what is revealed is that this, the, merch, the same merchant owns these two coins. What is not revealed is where did, he, where did the merchant get those two coins from? Is it from the same guy or from different customers? But at least you reveal that, you're, that these two coins were correlated to the same merchant, and that's a lot more information than, than not knowing that. Right? So the future transaction history can mess up your past transaction history. Even if you take steps like separating uh, payments into different transactions, that might be negated in the future. Uh, and, and the other critical thing is time. If you also want to prevent the timing analysis, then you have to wait couple hours, a couple days, a couple weeks, and that comes with a bunch of additional costs as well, including, of course, the price fluctuation uh, that, that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So wh what are other ways that, that we can improve our privacy here? 
uh, for, for making payments with the coins that we received in the past. Uh huh. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So here he brings up dandelion. What's what's dandelion? W what's the problem here, and what does it try to solve? <laughs> Explain it badly. That's a good enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is another nice attack that you bring up, and that is that we have to broadcast our transactions to the Bitcoin network. It's not just enough to sign it, you have you have to tell other nodes about it, and so if if that act is public as well, like for example, if if your static IP address, you know, is uh, and you forward a new transaction to a malicious node that's that's run by some surveillance, then they know that this address it, or this transaction was broadcast by this IP address, and if a couple days later you you do another the transaction with the same IP address, then that same uh, malicious entity knows that these two transactions were broadcast by the same node all of a sudden clustering those two transactions to belong to the same ident uh, ent identity um, or entity. And that, th that can be negated by being clever about how we broadcast transactions. And so the dandelion protocol is, um, in okay, the, the classical way of broadcasting a Bitcoin transaction is to connect to, let's say, eight different nodes and send them the transaction roughly at the same time. Um, so th and then each of these eight nodes forwards that transaction to another eight peers or whatnot. And that just repeats until basically every node, especially the, the Bitcoin miners, have seen this unconfirmed transaction. But there's a way to kind of find the origin of, of where it burst. Right? Uh, but with Dandelion, the way that we do it is you broadcast your transaction to one node, not to eight, and that one node broadcasts the transaction to another single node, not to eight, and that node broadcasts it again to just one node, not to eight, and we have a random number of hops where the transaction gets uh, forwarded until we hit a random point where we burst out and that node then sends it to eight different nodes. And all of these peers send it to eight other peers, etc. Uh, and, and so the, the point where the transaction gets broadcast from one node to eight other nodes is actually not the, the node that made that first that they made the transaction. It might be two, three, five hops away. It's a good question. So uh, how, how do we guarantee that where we burst the transaction out is it's not close to or, or the same node that made the transaction? I don't know, to be honest, about the details of the protocol. So. I don't know, but I guess you, you, your own node knows that this transaction is from you, a and so it wouldn't burst it out um, at that point. Seems like it would be pretty trivial to work around like that. Mm -hmm. just, if you see your own dandelion transaction, you can just send it on again. Mm -hmm. A little fail safe. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so transaction broadcasting is another thing that we have to consider here as well. Um, and of course, you could connect to, for example, a, a block explorer or something via Tor and use that to broadcast your transaction. You don't have to broadcast the transaction via your own node. Right? You, you can just spin up a new Tor identity and broadcast it to any random node who will then relay it. Okay, so now we've gotten paid a couple times to fresh addresses and, and we make payments where we're sure to not reveal which IP address is, is broadcasting this transaction. Uh, but there's other things that we have to consider uh, for, for privacy. Um, what are other concerns? Oh yeah, the, the, so the concern was the common input ownership heuristic. That if you make a payment with three coins, then uh, someone knows that these three coins belong to the same person. Uh, how do we prevent that? The, f the first approach was to split up that payment into multiple smaller transactions that each just spent a single input. 
but that costs time and that costs block space. So that's why it's quite expensive. Are there other solutions? Collaborative spending, coin joints. All right, so what's the definition of a coin joint? Multiple parties will have uh, inputs in the same transactions and outputs in the same transactions, and usually there's no, there should be no link between those two. Mm -hmm. Yep, so the, th the actual definition from a coin join is just that the inputs belong to multiple users. Outputs are completely disregarded from the definition of a coin join. I, so I agree with that, but do you have a source of that being the official definition? <laughs> <laughs> Some people disagree quite vehemently. Mm. Uh, I, I agree I, with you, though. I, I guess Gregory Maxwell, 2013. Or, uh, no, wait, Peter Todd is here. Right? He came up with the name, at least, of CoinJoin. Right. So I, I, I guess we have the authoritative yeah. source. I'm not sure that the original post... But um, w w anyway, it doesn't <laughs> matter, because I agree with you, so it's fine. Yeah, so I... Th I um, like the, so the, the history of CoinJoin is, is, is quite long. Like Even Satoshi mentioned the common input ownership heuristic in the white paper. And CoinJoin is just the, the inverse of that, you know? Yeah. Exactly. The bald fact that you can infer the common input ownership heuristic. So it's one of the only maybe two or three actual mistakes in the white paper. Yep. That, that line is wrong. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yep. Heresy. 100% wrong. <laughs> <laughs> read, the, read the line. It's <laughs> um, so uh, where's the difference between a coin join and a transaction batch? Or what's the definition of a transaction batch? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I think the difference between a coin join and a transaction batch is the coin joins have equal outputs, essentially. So with the transaction batch, um, we might, or let me rethink. Well, you know, as I said earlier, I think it's debatable, but the coin join definition disregards output outputs, entirely. Yeah. Right? Mm, yeah. Exactly. A transaction batch includes multiple outputs. And the transaction batch has a single signer. Aha. That's interesting, right? Now, now I guess if, if the definition of a coin join is about inputs and not about the outputs, arguably the definition of a transaction batch only regards the outputs and not the inputs. Right? So with a transaction batch, we have multiple outputs belonging to different people. Right? Uh, and the different people are the merchants that get paid. You know, one output goes to the pizza merchant, the other to the steakhouse, the third to the, the car dealership, whatever. So we have multiple owners of the different outputs of a single transaction. Arguably, that, that's, that's a transaction batch. Right? And, and we can have a transaction batch with one input and 10 outputs. And we could have a coin join, arguably, with 10 inputs and one output. You know, that, that might be 10 people working together to pay the same guy, for example. Arguably, that's... Well, yeah, argu arguably that's a, a coin join as well. Yeah, yeah. But so, I mean, that's the theoretical definition of, of coin join, so to say, but there's a practical definition as well. Uh, and, and someone mentioned earlier about the amount of uh, the coin join uh, outputs. So why is it important that we take care about the amounts that we put into a coin join? Um, because it's hard to future proof like if if you have a coin join let's say um with the equal output of one bitcoin and one bitcoin today is seventeen thousand, but in the future it's a million dollars per bitcoin and you haven't spent that bitcoin now whenever you spend that utxo you you basically reveal to whoever you're sending it to you have a million dollars worth of bitcoin mm -hmm. so you need to be plausibly similar to the other size inputs um, if you if you're doing a coin join and everyone else has 0 0.1 of a Bitcoin and you stick in your 25 Bitcoin UTXO, like they will split your 25 Bitcoin UTXO into loads of outputs and mm -hmm. some of them will match the other side. But all of the other, there's going to be a bunch of like 10 Bitcoin UTXOs in there that are just obviously yours and you can't be under the illusion that those are, you know, anonymized or anything like that. Mm hmm Right, this is the problem of an, an elephant trying to hide in, in an, uh, a crowd of ants. 
you know, everyone has 0.1 Bitcoin input and 0.1 Bitcoin output roughly. And you're that one guy with a 100 Bitcoin input and a 99 Bitcoin output, right? Well, well who, who created that 99 Bitcoin output? Beats me. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, that's really interesting, right? So what if we had, I don't know, 500 times 0 0.1, uh, which uh, sums up to what, 50 Bitcoin? And, and, uh, and we have one time a 50 Bitcoin input, uh, so, and then on the output side, we have one time 50 Bitcoin and 500 times 0 0.1, whatever, <laughs> then, then yeah, it could be that one guy owns the 500 times 0 0.1 and he consolidated that into a single 50 Bitcoin output versus the guy who owns the 50 Bitcoin input broke that down into 500 times 0 0.1. So yeah, that can happen, but how likely is it? And not <laughs> true, true. Um, so yeah, we, so we want to hide the transaction history, ultimately, that's, that's what we're trying to do here. And in order to do so, we need to create outputs that look pretty much the same. And so, and they have to look the same on, on different levels, right? So for example, if, if an output reuses the same address, uh, as, as the input, for example, then we know pretty clearly, okay, this output belongs to the same guy as this input because it's literally the same address. You know, so we could follow input to output in this example um, because the outputs don't look all indistinguishable. There's one output that is clearly different than the others. All the others are fresh addresses. This one output is, is the same address as used before. So that's a problem. Um, and the other thing is, um, for example, script types as well. If there's, let's say, one taproot input among a bunch of segwit zero inputs, and there's one taproot output among a bunch of segwit zero outputs, well, then it's kind of likely that this is the same guy. It's not conclusive evidence, but it seems like that's the case. Well, you um, could, could you potentially deliberately change that type just to throw off those kinds of analytics? Exactly, right? You could, you could have uh, segwit zero inputs and a taproot output. And the other guy has a taproot input, but only segwit zero outputs. So that can definitely happen. Yep. The fact that that's possible, does that mean no one would rely on the, the, pri the prior heuristic? Because people yeah. can do that, so let's just not bother doing it? Or do they still mm -hmm. assume it's done to some extent? People will maintain address types or mm -hmm. script types? Well, we don't, we don't really know because m I guess the only CoinJoin implementation with different script types right now is join market. Um, because because the taker can make a payment to a legacy uh, output, right? Um, but yeah, like all other current CoinJoin implementations have the same input and output script types. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in fact, soon in the future, Wasabi will have both SegWit0 and Taproot outputs, uh, inputs and outputs. So, and we actually randomized that on Wasabi's client side. So you randomly choose if you generate taproot or segwit zero in outputs. And yeah, lots of complexity there. Um, so the amount is an important identifier uh, because we want to look similar than other people. That's the size of the crowd, right? If, if each of us has a 0 0.1 Bitcoin output, then uh, there's a large crowd of people who own 0 0.1 Bitcoin in, the, in this coin join transaction versus one guy owning the 50 Bitcoin and, and the others owning way less. So we want to have a large size of the crowd um, in order to increase the, the ambiguity of who could be paying whom here. Th there's actually a really interesting uh, thing with Bitcoin, right? Uh, it, can we say which input pays which output? No, why not? Uh -huh. The thing is, uh, a big, uh, a Bitcoin is a measuring unit, like an inch or something. There's n there isn't like an, uh, a memory, uh, a piece of memory inside the code, you know, the, the, the running process that that's the Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a measuring unit. What, what actually exists are UTXOs, mm -hmm. and they are measured by the measuring unit of Bitcoins or Satoshis. So when you have multiple of them being destroyed, which is what happens in a transaction, and multiple being created, the consensus enforces 
the, 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 the sort of length of the measuring sticks added up on the one side equals, you know, on the other side, minus mm -hmm. fees. Um, but there's no actual... Now, of course, this is a very, like, interesting philosophical point because there's people who have not only proposed but even tried to build systems where they literally do watermark individual Satoshis using a, a FIFO principle where, you know, as they're created... As, because the outputs have an ordering, even though semantically mm -hmm. the ordering of the outputs is completely irrelevant to Bitcoin's process, they can pretend that the ordering of the outputs matters and then they, therefore they can say the first Satoshi is the first Satoshi in the first output and so on and... Uh, so you can create an ordering, but it's not intrinsic to the to the system. There's no actual um, mapping between inputs and outputs. Satoshi's. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, that's yeah, that's a great point, right? We have UTXOs, the the coins, the chunk of money. They are quite different. They each have often have a different address. There's a different amount of money in in that coin. And there's a different block that it was confirmed, etc. It's in a different transaction. So there's a lot of unique identifiers about each coin. Uh, and, and therefore, they're not fungible, so to say. But Satoshis are actually fungible. There's not a, a unique identifier for each Satoshi unit. And therefore, we cannot follow where this unique identified Satoshi moves from input to output. As Adam says, right? The Satoshi, uh, inputs get destroyed, and the Satoshis in those inputs get destroyed. And then on the output side, new coins get created, and the Satoshis just magically appear on the output side. So there's no flow from input to output. But of course, if, if we have, let's say, a transaction with one input and one output, and the question of which input paid this for this output is pretty obvious. There, there is only one input. So that's the one that paid for the output. Ah, <laughs> yes, exactly. That's where it gets really interesting then with coin swaps. Um, but so, so back to the coin joints, right? If, if we have many inputs and we have many outputs, then inherently there is no way to follow the Satoshi of a certain input to a certain output. However, there are still ways that we can reason about this. One of the ways we talked about is if there's a, a single huge input and a single huge output, you know, then it's pretty clear that this large input paid for this large output because none of the other small value inputs are large enough to, ha to would have created this really large output. And that's why it's important that we somewhat adjust the amount that we create um, so, so that we're a bit smarter about this. Um, and I guess since the early definitions or the, the early explanations of a coin join, it, the, the fact that there has to be, uh, like a coin join is, is a transaction with outputs that have exactly the same Satoshi value. Uh, that, that was, in the early days, kind of the, the, the common way of, of doing it. So, so why is it important that we have, on the output side, exactly the same amount for multiple outputs? Why is that important? To identify... Oh, sorry. Well, to identify if it comes from a particular input? Mm -hmm. So if we have exactly the same amount, it becomes difficult to identify from which exact input that's coming from. Um, and let, let's say we have uh, 10 outputs worth exactly one Bitcoin. Uh, and, and let's say we have, w among many inputs, we have one of them that's also one Bitcoin worth. Right? Then there's 10 different ways that we could interpret where this one Bitcoin from the input side went on the output side. It could have been the first in output, or the second output, or the third, or the tenth. Right? So there's ten different outputs that this specific input could have went into. Um, and if we have exactly the same amount, then there is like the, there's an, an actual ambiguity right? well, of, of which input could have gone into this specific output. Um, or, or in other words, the, 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 the transaction, the, the, the sub uh, the subset transaction, or there, there are 10 different possible interpretations of where this input could have gone to. Right? And, and that's what we know as k-anonymity of 10. Right? So there's a 10 different interpretations of this specific input in this specific transaction. And if we would have different amounts, then, it would not th then there would not be exactly 10 different solutions, most likely. It, it depends on, on, on the exact amounts. Um, but so in order to increase the ambiguity, in order to increase the number of possible interpretations of a certain transaction, 
we usually choose outputs that are exactly the same amount. Um, and that's, that's what CoinJoin implementations did for well, the vast majority of time. Um, or in fact, uh, one of the early uh, CoinJoin implementations called shared coin, uh, they didn't care anything about the amounts. So that was a merchant who, is, who wants to make a payment with three inputs and two outputs um, uh, to these specific amounts. Uh, he just combined his inputs and outputs with other people who want to make their payments. And they didn't adjust the amount at all. Um, they, they just made the payments that they actually wanted to make, but they put it together in a single large transaction. So that is a, a coin join with well, basically zero amount organization, uh, so to say. They, they just took the payment amounts that they want to make and put it together. Um, now there, there, were argu there, there was presumably a, a paper uh, called the uh, uh, coin join Sudoku that, that claims to be able to identify the, the actual subset transactions, like these inputs paid for these outputs, with a pretty high certainty. Um, and that's why ultimately the, that service was, was stopped because presumably the, the privacy guarantees of it were, were not sufficient. Right, that's not why it's stopped, right? Uh huh. They, 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 there wasn't like a shared coin version of this afterwards. Like Christoph, uh, Christoph Atlas wrote that uh, coin join Sudoku thing. Um, there was like a shared coin too briefly after that. But when they shut it down, they didn't shut it down because they realized it was crap. They shut it down because <laughs> they, you know, noises were made by regulators or something, and they thought, oh, we can't do this anymore because it was blockchain.info, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, interesting. But it, it remained crap to the end, if, if, that's, <laughs> if that's in any question. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and, and then so that's why in, instead of just taking the actual payment amounts that, that you want to make, which are, it's in some cases, quite easy to find the exact subset transaction that was the one that actually happened. Uh, because there's always one correct subset transaction. Um, there's always these three coins and those two, uh, three inputs and two outputs, for example, that belong to that user. And, and that's the truth, so to say. So there's one correct answer, and then there's a bunch of false answers. M maybe someone said, okay, these two inputs and these two outputs belong together. But that isn't actually the case, for example. Um, and so in order to increase the ambiguity, the, the, the number of possible interpretations of this transaction, we started to use common amounts. Right? Um, because if, we, if 10 users have exactly the same amount, then there's at least 10 interpretations of, uh, of, of which subset is, is correct here. Um, but that has a, so that there's benefits of using the same amount, but there's also downsides. So what are some of the downsides or problems when we start to use exactly the same amount on the output side of a coin join? The change, the change uh-huh. So wh what's, what's the change? The change is the difference between whatever UTXO input I give and the, um, the common amount. So let's, for example, if you're doing a point um, one Bitcoin common amount and I send a UTXO with 0.15, then I get 0 0.05 for change. And that's just my chain, so that would that could identify me. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. The so the the sum of the inputs that you register is most likely not going to be exactly the equal amount plus fees, and right? especially because of the plus fees. And so this means you will have some leftover amount, and if you don't put this into an output, you pay the miners. Right? So if you because you don't want to pay the miners the 0 0.05 Bitcoin you're gonna create a new output where 0.05 Bitcoin. But now an, an, an outside observer can, s can look and it's like, okay, so there's the equal amount of 0.1 and there's this other output where 0.05. So this means that th it's, it's quite likely there's one user who owns 0.15 Bitcoin on the input side. And now you can look on the input side and you're like, okay, so which inputs sum up to exactly 0.15? And maybe that's just one combination of inputs. Right? Um, and, and then we have a, a a, a certainty that the 0 0.05 change belongs to these set of inputs that sum up to exactly 0 0.15. So we've followed uh, the inputs to the change output. Even though for, for the equal amount output, because there are, there's 10 times 0 0.1, we don't exactly know which of these 0 0.1 input, uh, sorry, outputs belong to this input. Because, well, any one of them would, su would sum up to the correct amount. And so, uh, and so what do you have to do with a change coin in the future, if, if you have this change output? Join it again. 
Coin join it again, exactly. But the, the big problem is now you have the 0 0.5 Bitcoin change output, sorry, 0 0.05 Bitcoin change output, but the minimum denomination is 0 0.1 Bitcoin. Right? So you, you don't have enough value in this change output to put it into a coin join that has the 0 0.1 Bitcoin uh, denomination. So what do you do? <laughs> I guess it would depend on the implementation, right? Because if you do a, I guess in join mark, you can do a sweep. Uh -huh. um, and, and it doesn't really, I don't, I don't know that there's a minimum, like other than, I guess, the um, relay, like mempool relay issue, mm -hmm. or like dust limit, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so, so real great, right? You could use join market. One of the great things about join market is that one user can, can choose exactly which standard denom or which out equal output amount are we going to use. And so if you're that one user and you have a 0 0.05 Bitcoin input, you can say to everyone else, hey, let's create an equal amount of 0 0.05. And then this is a sweep because that one user does not get a change output because his input sum minus fees is the equal amount of this coin join round. And so that's one of the crazy cool benefits about join market, that a user can specify and, and tell other users, hey, let's all create outputs of exactly this value. And, and, and one of the benefits is you can get rid of change. You can, you can send an even a small value input and get only equal amount outputs with no change at all. And so yes, that's, that's one, one of the ways that you could do it. Um, one other way was earn more Bitcoin, right? So stack more sats. Right? So then you have, uh, so if, if you cannot decide what the output equal amount is, then you have to earn more money, get another coin, and now you consolidate multiple coins in this coin join. Right, so let's say you get a 0 0.5, a 0 0.05, and a 0 0.07, for example, these two inputs you have now. And that gives you a 0 0.1 output, and again, a 0 0.02 change. Right? Um, so now we only kick the can down the road, right? because even in that second transaction, we still get a change. Uh, and the sad thing is now this change can be used to find the inputs that you have. Right, because a 0 0.02 change coin plus the 0 0.1 equal denomination means that one guy had to have the 0 0.12, exactly. And maybe there's only this combination of those two coins, the 0 0.05 and the 0 0.07, that sum up to exactly 0 0.12. And all of a sudden, we've revealed to the outside world, again, that these two inputs belong to the same person. Right? We've, we've revealed common ownership of these two inputs because of a arbitrary amount change output that can be tied with subset sum analysis to the inputs. Is that the problem that the toxic change exactly. That's the toxic change problem. If there's only one equal denomination in a coin join, basically every user will have a non-standard amount change. And that non-standard amount change can be tied to the input sum, which reveals common ownership of the inputs, which is what we want to avoid. <laughs> Right. And simultaneously, people can follow where you spent that change in the future. Right? So they know that this one guy controlled these multiple inputs, and he got this change output, and we can say that with pretty high certainty. And then we can see where he spent his change output in the future. And maybe he spent his change output while consolidating it with other inputs. And we know this because there was a change output in the second transaction. Mm -hmm. So if there's like 10 other joiners in mm -hmm. this coin join, that would, would, I guess, give you less or more heuristics? Or, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm like explaining this correctly, but you see so, what I'm saying? Uh -huh, so maybe a way to think about this is what's, what's easier to, find, to, to link the inputs to the change output? A, a transaction with, let's say, five inputs and like two equal amount change outputs uh, sorry, two equal amount outputs and two change outputs, you know, that versus a transaction with like 500 inputs and, and 500 outputs, you know, because uh, if there's multiple inputs and, and multiple users, then it might be that there is a couple of inputs that sum up to exactly 0 0.12, right? And, and that just doesn't happen once, but there's multiple groups of inputs that sum up to your change output plus equal amount. And then we have ambiguity again. Right? There's multiple possible subset transactions here that, that could be the truth, 
but we don't know if input one, two, and three is the one that funded that change output plus equal amount, or if it's input one, five, and seven, or input three, four, six, whatever, right? So there's multiple interpretations if we increase the size of this coin join. Um, and that's one of the interesting things with shared coin, actually. Like, if we have not just a small shared coin transaction, so again, shared coin is this, this coin join where we don't care about the amounts at all. People make payments and we just put them together, right? We don't change the amounts at all. So if this is a very small coin join, that's trivially easy to, to follow. But if it's, if it's getting really, really large, then it becomes more difficult to link inputs to inputs or inputs to outputs or outputs to outputs. Right? It might still be possible, and it depends a lot on that unique or specific case, but at least we can say it's more difficult than if it's smaller. Right? So yes, arguably increasing this, the number of users in a transaction, the size of a coin join, that makes it more difficult to, to do this linking. Might still be possible, um, especially if you get additional metadata later on, but for sure it's more difficult. Um, so, and then there is, so if we, if we create uh, like w one equal amount uh, anon set denomination, like for example, join market does or Wasabi 1.0 did, um, then uh, we, we get a change coin, right? And the, the more value input you have, the larger your change value is gonna be. So let's say you have a 50 Bitcoin input, you get a 0 0.1 equal amount, and a 49.9 change output. So w what does that mean? Like, is that a good thing, is that a bad thing? Um, I guess it means that you only have um, a privacy gain on the 0.1, mm -hmm. but the 49.9, is um, still, I guess, vulnerable to heuri um, on-chain heuristics. Exactly. Right, and analysis. Yep. Right, so you've, you've destroyed an input and you've created an output, but that change output can very easily be linked to your input. And again, we're doing this because we, we try to obfuscate our transaction history. But now we've purchased block space to register an input and to register the change output. So we spent money, but we didn't get any benefit whatsoever. Right? So the larger the change value is, the more inefficient it is because we just purchase block space without getting any benefits. Right? So the, the one of the many goals is to, to decrease the value of the change output because then we, we buy a change output w that still costs a lot, the same amount of block space, um, but at least we get more outputs that, that are equal, uh, that, that have these equal denominations. And that's what we did with Wasabi 1.1 or something like this. We added multi-denominations on the output side. So not just did you get a 0.1 Bitcoin equal amount, there was also 0.2 and 0.4 and 0.8 and 1.6. Right? So if you have a 50 Bitcoin input, you get your 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.8, and that's what, 1.5? Uh, so you get your 48.5 change output. Right, so it's still a very large value change, and you still spent a block space to create that change output, even though it was trivially linkable to the input. But at least now you got your five or six different coins that have equal amounts. Right, so this arguably increases efficiency. Right? The more different equal denominations we have, the, the more private outputs do we get, and uh, there's less value in the non-private change outputs. Right? But so, w but why is that still a problem? Why is that still not, not great? <laughs> yeah, you still got change, exactly. Right? And whenever you have change, that is a really important information to deduce which inputs belong to the same user. Right? And especially how it was in Wasabi 1.0, everyone knew how you decomposed your, your amounts. Like if you have 50 Bitcoin, let's say, Everyone knew, that, that, like the standard protocol is, first you generate a 0 0.1. If you have amount left over, you generate a 0 0.2. If you have amounts left over, you generate a 0 0.4, and so on. Right? So there was, there was no way in Wasabi 1.0 that one user got two times 0 0.1, for example. Um, and this means if, if we see a change output of, of 48 Bitcoin or something, 
then we know that that user for sure got all the equal amounts as high as it went in this transaction. So the same user who got that uh, 48 Bitcoin change was in the 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.8 round. If, if those, that was the h highest equal amount on, on the output side. And now we can sum up 48 change plus 0.1, plus 0.2, plus 0.4, plus the fees equals the value of the I inputs that this specific user registered. And most likely there's only one set of inputs that sum up to exactly this. So because we know the uh, change output, we know with high likelihood this, the, which inputs belong to the same users. And, and that's, that's still an issue. Um, and again, the, the whole reason why we want to do these coin joins is to break the common input ownership heuristic. But as soon as we have a change output, and as soon as we have a deterministic way of how to break down an input value into these equal amount output values, then there is a way to link multiple inputs to each other and, and to link these multiple inputs to the change. And, and, and you will have to register your change in the future again, maybe with other inputs, and it's just a rat tail of, of linkability, so to say. So what can we do about this? How, how can we design the system better to get rid of the change? <laughs> well, no, actually. <laughs> I mean, because like, you, you, sure, you could open a lightning channel with those 48 Bitcoin, but it's still 48 Bitcoin, right? It would be a Wumbo reckless channel for sure. <laughs> um, so, but, but Lightning is interesting, right? Because, so one of the things with Lightning is that the value of the output does not equal the value of money belonging to one side of the channel, right? We can have dual funded channel, channels that start with different values on each side. So let's say we have a, a 48 Bitcoin output well, but maybe that was a dual fund between two users. One of them put in 20 Bitcoin and the other 28 Bitcoin. Right? And this all of a sudden messes up our subset sum because it looks as if there was an output worth 48 Bitcoin. So it seems that there must be a sum of inputs of, of that much and that they belong to the same person. I mean, there is a, a collection of inputs that sum up to 48. However, they don't all belong to the same person. So we would assume common input ownership where in fact it's wrong. Right, so here this would be a, a, a wrong uh, uh, yeah, sub-transaction guess, so to say. So yes, there's benefits in that. I especially there's benefits in that if you don't know that this output is in fact a lightning channel. Right, so using taproot on the script and not announcing that channel, et cetera, brings a bunch of benefits. Right? Wh what other smart ways can we do to get rid of the change? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's good if you're the miner, right? Join Use join market is the other Mercury one. Wallet. Sorry? Mercury um, mer so Mercury Wallet uses state chains, and state chains, in, in the way it's set up by Mercury, means that a, a state chain has standard amounts. So you only open a state chain if it's worth exactly 0 0.5 Bitcoin, for example. But let's say you have a 1.2 Bitcoin input, then you open your 0 0.5 state channel, uh, state coin or state chain, but then you got 0 0.7 change or whatever, right? Uh, well, the change is related to your inputs, right? So like, uh, okay, but, but there's been, like the way Mercury designed their state chains is with uh, atomic swaps in mind. And atomic swaps only work if you have the same amount you're not gonna swap 0 0.5 Bitcoin for 1.2 Bitcoin with a random guy. I mean, you can swap with me if you want, but <laughs> I'll, I'll get to the 1.2, please. Then. <laughs> right, so uh, they, they designed it with equal amounts or standard amounts for the size of the state, chan uh, state chains. Um, but e any standard amount, equal amount still leads to change problem because the, the sum of your input values won't be exactly the standard amount that, that, that you chose, right? So. It's a very similar problem, actually, to, to coin joins. Yeah, 
Exactly. You could create, a so if you have a 1.2 Bitcoin input, you could create a state chain with 0 0.5 and 0 0.7. Right? So we have two different state chains of this amount. But then again, you can't swap between these two state chains, which is the whole design of Mercury Wallet. So it, even though it works for making state chain transfers, you can then transfer the 0 0.7 state coin and the 0 0.5 state coin, how uh, many oftentimes you want, but you can't swap one for the other. Unless you swap a 0 0.5 and a 0 0.2 for the 0 0.7. Right, so that, that would work too, it just gets more and more complex. to have like a, okay, this is like a little off tangent, but you could have like a swap market then where people would like different, you could like have a place where you just like swap credentials for equal amounts in chain as a way to like mix, whatever, okay. Yeah, I mean, so Mercury has this market for swaps, mm -hmm. but because they use the same amount for each of the state chains, mm -hmm. you have a way larger number of users because mm -hmm. every user has the 0 0.5 Bitcoin state coin and so when they swap, they just have the, the same amount, you yeah. know, and so there's a higher anonymity set. Right, yeah. Oh, it's already over. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh -huh. Wait for it to be enough, and then you take it out. Uh -huh. So that's basically a custodial mixer, so to say, right, where you deposit any arbitrary amount, a couple days later, you withdraw any arbitrary amount that, that I mean you, you have. You wait in your wallet to have enough change to send it there, mm -hmm. and then you send it there, and then you wait like, well, whatever you say, and then you keep it, uh, take it back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's blasphemy, I know. <laughs> uh, in, in a matter of time, I, d oh, okay, I didn't get to talk about anything that I actually wanted to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me quickly rush through some of the things that, that are possible solutions here, right? So, so what Wasabi 1.0 did is it decomposed from the bottom up. So everyone got the smallest equal denomination, 0.1, then the next larger one, then the next larger one, etc. Which means we have a pretty high value change. Right? If we would have done it the other way, right, that we decompose from the top down, you first get a 0 0.8 and then a 0 0.4 and, and so on. You, uh, like, that uh, could have helped, right? Or allowing the same user to get multiples of that equal amount. So instead of just getting the 0 0.8 one time, you get five times 0 0.8. And, and then we have more equal amounts and less value in the change. Um, a, so yes, these two, these two things can help with changing or with reducing the number of change. Um, another thing is to be more smart about which equal denominations we choose. So in Wasabi 1.0, we use the 0 0.1 and multiples thereof. Uh, sorry, not multiples, but uh, exponentials thereof. So 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.8, 1.6, etc. Um, however, we, we can get better in decomposing if we have more different equal amounts or standard amounts to choose from. So in Wasabi 2.0, we now have powers of 2, powers of 3, 2 times powers of 3, uh, powers of 10, 2 times power of 10, and 5 times power of 10. These are the equal denominations, or the standard amounts, rather, uh, that we use in 2.0. So there is between 0 and 1 Bitcoin, there is, I believe, 42 standard denominations that you can choose from. Um, and these standard denominations are chosen in a way that it, it is more efficient to decompose any arbitrary input amount into these equal denominations. So even if you have 1 1.2345 5 whatever input uh, value on the input side, you can get in less than eight outputs of standard denominations exactly that amount minus fee. So regardless of what your input value is, you get equal amount output values and no change anymore. Um, and an an another way where, where 2.0 differs is that the, it's no longer dictated exactly how you are supposed to decompose your input amounts. So again, in 1.0, you were forced to get the 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, etc. Versus in 2.0, this is now a complete client-side user choice. You know, if, if you want to get five times the same equal amount, 
you can do that. Or if you want to get each amount just once, you can do that. Um, so there's now a lot more client-side choice of how we decompose, which means we can find more solutions of how we decompose without getting any change. Um, and and that's, that's quite helpful as well. Um, an another important thing here is, uh, again, we, we don't want to reveal common input ownership. And one way of doing that is to randomize the number of inputs that are being selected. So in Wasabi 1.0, you, you had to have at least 0.1 Bitcoin. And um, you, you could not register more than seven inputs, for example. However, so if, if there was an input worth 0.01, we knew that that user had to have another input because otherwise he can't get the 0.1 equal output. Versus with, with 2.0, we can, uh, you can have a single input worth 5,000 sats, and that's it. Or you could have multiple inputs. So in, in fact, in, in, in 2.0, there's now a random choice of how many inputs do we select. It can be one, it can be 10. Uh, there's also a random choice of which input groups we select. You know, if, if you have I don't know, 30 coins in your wallet, there's many different options that you could pick eight coins out of those. Uh, and, and that's a random choice as well. Uh, so, which means we have a much more ambiguity in, in how many coins and what's the input value, the input sum value of this user. Which then, if we break that down onto the output side, there is a much more ambiguity of how many outputs you get and which equal denominations you get and if you get multiples of the same equal denomination. Um, and now you can decompose from the top to the bottom as well. Uh, so all of this basically means is that it is now possible to, well, to have, that's by the way, Wasabi 2.0 coin, uh, coin join. We have the inputs on the left and the outputs on the right. And as you see, so there's 150 inputs, 159 outputs. I just picked a random one. And the largest equal amount here is 1.291, which is represented three times. And you see each of these output values here are these standard denominations. And I don't see a single non-standard amount here. Maybe, maybe there is one or two, but most of the outputs are, are standard amounts. And most of these outputs have multiples of the same denomination. Right? So we have classical k-anonymity set. And the cool thing is, most of these users, or most of these outputs, are going to be registered in the next coin join. Which means, if we look to the input side, all of a sudden we have a bunch of standard amount inputs. And multiples of these standard amounts on the input side. So we don't just have k-anonymity set on the outputs, we also have it on the inputs as well. I guess that's the end of the quick summary of 2.0. Uh, any final questions before I hand the word over to Adam? All right, so thanks very much for your attention. And on to the next one.